told me this was going to be a simple extraction. They were waiting for me. What was waiting for me was barely human. It tore the back off my car. Grow a spine, Solo. This is the most dangerous time in our history. We recently discovered an international criminal organization with an atom bomb. We have no choice but to work together on this. America teaming up with Russia. That doesn't sound very friendly. We'll leave you two to get acquainted. I'll let you tag along, but it's in and out, no mess, and we both forget about in the morning. This is not the Russian way. You ought to investigate Victoria Vinciguerra. They will send an army to stop us. We must give them an appropriate welcome. It's better for the mission that we get to know each other a little bit more intimately. What does that mean? It means I like my woman strong. So you want to wrestle? No, I did not say that. Hold on, cowboy! You're a special agent, you know what happened? Guy, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, talk to me about casting this movie. You have these two incredibly uh, handsome and charming leads, and you also have uh, Alicia Vikander. Vikander? Excuse me if I'm saying it correctly. Um, yeah, not many people say it right. Uh, Alicia Vikander. I have to say the first name so I can get the second name right. <laughs> Alicia Vikander. She's amazing. Uh, from Ex Machina to this, she's, she's just incredible. Uh, how did you go about casting this movie? Um, <clears throat> my principal interest is making sure that I get on with the actors. So, because, you know, you're with them for four or five months. And <clears throat> four or five months is a long stretch in anyone's life. And you just want to make sure that it's going to be as painless as possible. Most of your time is spent debating and figuring things out with them. Not necessarily debating, but having... A creative collaboration. It's a lot of communication. Now there is debate that takes place as well, but primarily I choose them as long as they have the certain requisites that makes them what potentially could be a movie star. Then it's really all about whether we're going to get on and whether we can collaborate constructively and whether we're going to enjoy one another's company. So as I say, that's no small part of the equation is choosing people that you go to like and that's you know really why I choose them. Have you ever had an instance where you were going into a movie and you were started working with someone or getting close to getting into production and both of you may have realized that like maybe it just wasn't going to work between the two of you? Um, that usually it has happened to me and it's rare but it's usually happened once you've committed. It's a bit like um, kids kick up a fuss when you've just passed the halfway line on your journey and they know it's too far to go back and that's when they start driving you mad. And there's, you know, there's a, an annoying bit in all of our character that can't help but be truculent and every now and then you're unlucky with an actor and you commit to the actor and then on the second day it's too late to go back and then the real personality comes through. It's rare, though. You basically let them know on the second day, in so many words, it's too late to go back. No, they let me know. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you have these two guys. Um, did you chemistry test them? Did you work with them on set to, to, to get the chemistry? I mean, they're really incredible in the movie. They're, they're both fantastic. Um, well, thank you for saying that. Um, a lot of it is about whether, not whether I just get on with them, is whether they get on with one another. So there's quite a lot of sort of, Sir John's to the pub um, before we make any major commitments to working together. So everyone was very familiar with one another before we committed to anything. Now the style of this film, you're, you know, the last, last films that you were making before, you were doing uh, the late 19th century Sherlock Holmes era and now you're doing the 1960s here, Cold War, and you're doing some of what you were doing before with Sherlock Holmes. Is there's, it's a, sort of an updating to an already stylized period. You're taking that style, the style of this period, the 1960s, and you're totally updating it to, to a certain degree with, with what you do, modernizing it. How do you figure out what's too much, what's, what's too little, what the boundary is or the line? Um, you know, it's not an intellectual process, that. Um, it's a kind of an instinctive thing that takes place. 
And really that's what a director's job is, is to somehow be consistent with his tone. And that the tone is broad, so it's everything to do with the aesthetic. Um, so that sort of happens unconsciously. Um, and I'm not sure how that process happens, but it's, it's what you feel, I suppose, as a director, that you feel as though you have an expression, you have an avo a voice, and that <clears throat> somehow that sort of comes out. But to sort of uh, try and articulate it is, is hard to do. How that process takes place, I've no idea. It's kind of just like, this is, what I'm, this is what my brain is telling me to do with this scene, and this is what I feel like is right, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, there's, you know... In sport, as soon as you start thinking about what it is that you're doing, it all goes tits up. But if you don't let your mind get in the way too much, then things seem to sort of run smoothly. And I think the creative process is very much like that. Initially, you need to sort of define what your creative barriers are going to be, and then you've just got to forget it. And then in intuitively uh, let it roll, so to speak. Now you're, I think you have four films in a row that are of different time periods, right? You have the Holmes, uh, the, the Sherlock, uh, two, the two Sherlock films. You have this and you have uh, King Arthur coming out as well, right? All four sort of modern, your modern takes on this time period? Yeah, I've sort of built up a momentum of enjoying challenges, which previously I would have found too intimidating. Um, and I've sort of built up a bit of, directing is mostly about confidence. Yeah. Um, and I built up a sort of a confidence that, oh, I don't know how to do that genre. Can I have a go at that genre? I don't know how to do that genre. Can I have a go at that genre? And that's really what's happened because I could, you know, I, I was weaned on um, urban, London, small gangster stuff. And I was comfortable in that world. And to try and get out of that hard. And, you know, the, with the Sherlock, what happened was is someone presented, uh, I said, because I was being too fussy about what I was trying to do. And I thought, hold on, my mind's getting in the way here too much. And I said, the next script that turns up on my desk, I'm going to make it. And the next script that turned up was Sherlock Holmes. So I thought, oh, how, was this going to, how much of a challenge is this going to provide? I did like Sherlock Holmes as a kid, which was advantageous, but it was a completely new world for me. But after I made that, I could see the correlations between that which I was familiar with and how much you could do that was unfamiliar but was exciting and you didn't overstretch. And then, well, I thought, well, after I did that, I thought, well, why don't we take a sojourn into the 60s with Man From Uncle? Um, and now, you know, you feel quite confident there. And, you, well, why not now go back to the 8th century and have a go at King Arthur? So, as I say, that's really confidence. Was there a time that you ever didn't feel confident with, with the work? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... My first film, <clears throat> unluckily or luckily, was quite successful. And, but I was relatively inexperienced as a film director. And then you get judged by a different yardstick because you're already out. Um, although I made loads of music videos, I made loads of commercials, I made a short film, and then my first film um, arguably took me to a position where I then felt, well, hold on, I can't really take any gambles now. Um, so I did uh, Lockstock, then I made a film called Snatch, and then after Snatch... I... Give it up, oh, right. Snatch. Thank you very much. If you feel like breaking out in spontaneous applause, I will always be receptive. <laughs> uh, and then after Snatch, and, th and then I could see I was going to get pigeonholed, or I was, I was worried that I was just going to stay in that genre. So I started... Do, I did, made a film called Swept Away, which I got annihilated for. And then uh, I did Revolver, which I got... That was the second barrel. The first barrel they took me out with, uh, with Swept Away and then the second barrel Revolver. And I tell you, that was nearly the end of my career. So you sort of wish you'd done those at the beginning because I didn't take a salary on either of those because I wanted to just kind of stretch. You didn't take a salary on Swept Away or Revolver? No. And both of them <clears throat> hurt your career? In, in, in oh, no, they... They pretty much ended it. And then it was really about starting again at the end of those two. So how did you, how did you start again, and how much do you think you owe to the success of the first Sherlock film? Um, well, then I made a film called The Real Rock and Roller. Oh, no, Rock and Roller. Rock and Roller. And Rock and Roller sort of put me back on the map again. Um, and then people felt 
you know, I, I had a sort of fan base around that world, and people felt familiar with that, and they felt confident with that. Um, and that sort of put me back, and then people were confident to give me money again, and then from that came um, Sherlock. Uh, and then as soon as the Sherlock did well, then, you know, everyone got built up a bit of momentum of confidence. And I felt as though I'd... It, I'd stretched my wings and I could feel where the boundaries of filmmaking lie, what, what people will let you get away with and what they won't let you get away with. Um, so I felt, as, I felt more experienced by the time I came round to Sherlock and the next Sherlock. Um, so that's sort of where I am now, you know. I, uh, one more question about this, because I had no idea that you had uh, foregone your salary to make those two movies. When you look back on that time, Take away what the critical response to the film was. When you look back on those two movies and you think about the decision to make them and how far you went to make them, how do you feel you know, so many years later? Um, well, I was naive. Uh, and part of the process of about becoming a filmmaker is to find out how naive you are. So, uh, I, I mean, I love uh, Revolver. Um, however, I do appreciate it. It's relatively esoteric to understand. Um, and I like Swept Away, so I don't regret either of them. But if you were the sort of... The thing is, is who knows what's the best way to play your cards? I have no idea, really. You play the cards that you play, and then in the end, you sort of summarise where they played in the right place, and I'd, I'd have to say that they probably were, you know? The question is, is can, can you sustain confidence while you're taking a kicking? Uh, I mean, it's like... Could you? Uh, no, no, you lose your confidence. <laughs> <clears throat> and then you start again and you try and build it up again. But, you know, that's the human story, isn't it? I mean, it's all our, that's all our stories, really. Was, uh, was Sherlock Holmes, was that a uh, Robert Downey Jr. property already that he brought to you as a director? Or did you cast him? I, I don't remember specifically. Now, specific. on, uh, on Rock and Roller, I worked with Susan Downey. She was the producer. And then Robert got quite involved with uh, Rock and Roller and he had all sorts of ideas about how the credit sequence should look. It was quite a good credit sequence actually. So Rob and I became friendly over that and then Sherlock ended up on my desk. I said, right, I'm going to make that. And then Rob was like in the next door room and I went, Rob, do you want to be in it? <coughs> and then uh, it really wasn't more complicated than that. Because that was a, a sort of revitalization for both your career and, and him. I mean, he had had Iron Man, I think, at yeah, that point. Yeah, but he'd still, already, he'd already he come out in Iron Man, so he was starting to turn into a bit of a thing. Um, but, yeah, he still wasn't the thing that he became. Now, with The Man from Uncle, there are so many great uh, allusions to, or references to, not just things that were going on in that time, but movies of that time. And the, the way that we remember style in, in movies and in, in television shows... What kind of people do you sort of build around you for production design, for, 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 for music selections, to, to find all these things? Are you working with people who've worked in this genre before or have a sort of knowledge of that, or are all of you just digging in as deep as you can go together? It's a bit of both. Um, it's funny, just on the way we were coming here, we dropped in on the double RL Ralph Lauren store, and it, it, it has a fantastic way of presenting his gear, you know? Uh, even on the tables that all the clothes are presented on have been, I mean, where, did he, where does he find those tables? You know, they're very well chosen. And then, of course, you realise there's an enormous creative infrastructure behind that. And um, I suppose as I get older, I become more and more interested in different creative elements. So when we were in the shop, I was saying, well, why don't we have one of these shops? Um, where you could have, you have a little creative team and they bring in things that, you, that they think are of creative value in whatever field. Um, and filmmaking's very much like that, you know? Uh, it's about finding like-minded people that are interested in different forms of creative expression. And I, I, that's really where we get all our ideas from. You get heads of department, and the heads of department are experts at their field. And then, of course, you, in turn, you spend months with them, and then you start. I mean, I've rather embarrassingly become very interested in ladies' fashion, which I could never, I could never foresee. That's so interesting. There's a part in the movie where 
are the two male leads are debating women's fashion in, in, in a clothing store. Does that come from, from you? Yeah, it does. It came from a guy, actually, I met in New York a few years ago. And, it, it, you know, he was sort of a bit of an underground character. And his job was to uh, make sure, like, hot models and whatnot would turn up to parties. And uh, he, he was, like, a really butch guy, this guy. He was, like, a fighter and he was this, that and the other. And his job was to sort of look after all these beautiful ladies... And he was really over the fact they were beautiful. And he found beauty to be a... It was an incumbent upon someone's personality. Um, I've completely forgotten your question. Now I'll start talking about pretty girls. Oh, yeah, so now... Uh, <laughs> so what it was is that this guy um, would be talking... These girls would, like, come in and he'd go, Look, love, you can't wear that. You've got to wear this. And he'd go into the details of exactly what they were wearing and which season it came from and which designer it came from. And this guy was like a proper street guy. And the juxtaposition of this like proper street guy who knew everything about ladies' fashion, it sort of opened a sort of new door to me. I thought, well, if he's interested in ladies' fashion, maybe I could be interested in ladies' and fashion. And it'd be okay. <laughs> and it'll be okay. Yeah. And then of course, once you've opened that door, it all becomes very interesting. So this was a script that had been uh, been around for a little bit, a little while, right? It had been in development uh, for for some time. Did you? I mean, hearing this and hearing this story about like the interest in women's fashion, did you come in as a director and sort of put some some new twists and some new elements into it? Yes and no, because the the woman that we um, ended up hiring is a black belt in the world of sixties fashion. So <laughs> no matter how confident you feel. Uh, you suddenly realize that you're... You're, you're like, <laughs> I'd like an argument about women's fashion over here. Just give me all the words that they'll yeah, say. Yeah, so that <laughs> And what about the, uh, all of the action sequences and the stunts that these guys are doing? Um, what about them? Are, they, are these things that you're coming up with that you're putting into the script? Were they already in the original drafts? Oh, no, no. The, the, we inherited a draft that we could do nothing with at all. Um, it had 30 people. I mean, it had been banded around for years, which I didn't really know anything about. And someone said, look, Man From U.N.C.L.E., and I remembered the series from the 70s, reruns in the U.K., and I remembered loving them. And uh, so that's all I needed was my memory of what Man From U.N.C.L.E. was. And I'd never, I, I made sure I didn't go back to the source material. I just, whatever it was that I remembered, I tried to capture uh, with this. So that was my main motivation. Did that answer the question? No, that answers the question yeah. perfectly. I think that sort of shows a, a clear idea as to what the movie is. It's not you going back and trying to recreate that. It's you having this idea of it and creating that. Yeah, it's whether you feel as though you're confident enough to make that manifest. You know, I remember when I was first interested in directing, trying to read a book on directing, and there's this thing that you guys won't know about. It's called Crossing the Line. And so there's one camera over here. These guys will know what crossing the line is. Okay, I've 180 degree line, right? I no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know what crossing the line is. So there's the embarrassing moment where I've made, I don't know, six or seven or eight feature films. I don't know. And uh, we'll ask the director and you know, he'll, t he'll tell you whether it crosses the line or not. I haven't got a clue what, what, still where that line is. Um, but you don't really need to. What you need is... Um, an impression and you need to be able to delegate to people that know how to make that become manifest if I wasn't a director I, I wanted to be an architect and but I, there's no way I could ever do any of the drawings but I, I like the idea that you just come up with an image and then guess what there's lots of clever people in the world that will work out how that technically works Hans Zimmer, who did the score for the two Sherlock's, is probably the most prolific uh, composer in history. And Hans' uh, uh, ability to understand music technically, and um, don't quote me exactly on this, but I seem to remember this being the case. Hans Zimmer is like the best guy in the world, by the way. Yeah. Um, that he doesn't really understand music. He just understands music. He just doesn't understand, understand it technically. So he goes, well, what do you like the sound of? And I go, oh, I don't know, just that. He goes, right, I know exactly what you mean. And then he's got a bunch of clever guys that make that become manifest. So really a sort of director, I think, is 
guy that has an, uh, an impression of something and has the ability to make it become manifest. And that, a lot of that is just delegation. Um, talk to me about the music in this film. I mean, there's Ennio Morricone references. There's also just some incredible 60s tracks that I had never heard before that, that, that I loved. Whose CD collection were you digging into for this? Um, if I didn't, well... Or MP3 but, collection, sorry, guys. Um, I've gone back to vinyl, actually, now. <laughs> um, the other thing that, if I wasn't an architect, I would have been a musician. So I was, I'm very into music. Uh, although I don't, again, know much about it. Um, but my first job, I left school when I was 15. I went and worked at A&R for a, a company that was called Island Records um, in London. And that, I loved that. I just wasn't very good at it, so they jogged me on. Um, but I've never got rid of my enthusiasm for music. So I was always, on this film, I spent a lot of time beating up the composer trying to explain to him that I wanted to be subservient to his vision and that music should lead the way and then I would worry about the visuals following the music. And that's sort of just the way I feel about music. I think I either want a score to be there or not there. I'm, I'm, some people say that a good score you don't notice. How can you be subservient to his vision when he's constantly asking you if what he's doing is okay? That's quite a good question, actually. <laughs> um, but in the end... I'm quite dominant about the music. So to, to explain to the composer that basically I have a scene, but the scene is being led by the visuals rather than it being led by the rhythm of the music. And the music has to be more conspicuous for me in order for it to work. And then secondary to what's primary, primary being the music, then the visuals will fall in rhythm with the music. Um, so it's really a question of making sure that that music is more dominant and giving him the authority to lead that charge. And now you have a, a cameo uh, from Hugh Grant in the, in the film. When you bring someone of sort of a certain amount of British royalty into a spy film, does it just immediately kind of class it up a bit more? Uh, the funny thing is, is Hugh, I, I don't think Hugh knew what he was getting into, and it's funny, after you saw it, he said, by the way, Guy, that's the first time I've been in a cool film. <laughs> um, and I think he was kind of shocked about the fact that it was quite a stylish piece. And the idea being that, you know, if this works and we were lucky enough to go back and, and make another one, uh, that Hugh would have a much larger part in it. In the, in the original series, um, Waverley, as he's called in this, played a much bigger role. He's kind of cue to Bond, if you will. I actually had a slightly larger role than that. I think we have some time for questions. Does anyone have any questions out here? We have a, right here. When did you discover that you wanted to be a director? Um, I discovered I wanted to be a director when I was, I was very young. Um, 13 or so, I reckon. Uh, the first film I saw, which was, that I really got inspired by, was Butch Casting, The Sundance Kid. And talking about music, um, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head by Burt Baccarat at the time. It, it was a complete music video within a Western. And Westerns up to that point had been True Grit, Tough Stuff, um, John Wayne, Man Stuff. And all of a sudden, Butch Casting the Sundance Kid is really quite camp, but the best, the best on the best side of camp. And it, I just found it much more accessible. Um, to sort of everyone, you know, you could really love these guys. They were kind of broad guys. They were sort of like the guy I was describing that was here, you know. They knew about sort of women's clothing at the same time they could shoot someone at a thousand paces. Um, and then from there, I I've re realized that cinema could speak to me, certain things could speak to me. And I had absolutely no qualifications in anything else. So there was nothing else I could do. So it was a combination of, I mean, I can barely read them right now. Um, and it was a combination of not being able to do anything else and me just wanting to do that. But it was in England. And in England, there, is, there was no film industry. So it was a bit of a fantasy. Uh, so, and I couldn't find a way into the industry at all. So I sort of gave up everything. And I became... I did every 
sort of manual job known to man until I was 25. And at 25, I found someone else that was in the business and I worked as his runner for a couple of years and then, and then from there on, I, was, I made myself busy. But it was very young, but I just couldn't find a way in and eventually I found a way in. How, um, how old were you when you made Lockstock? Um, I made Lockstock when I was 30, I think. I think we finished it when we were 30. You finished it when you were 30. What was the, what was the budget on Lockstock? Uh, it was a million, million dollars. It was a million dollars. And the budget on something like Sherlock is well over $100 million. Oh, uh, mate. That's, yeah, King Arthur's a beast. And it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's considerably more than that. Do you, have, do you have moments on the set, even as you've done it three, four times now, movies with budgets like this, where you look around and you think back to the days on Lockstock, where you look, you look around and you say, how did Lockstock take me here? Uh, yes and no. It's a funny thing because zeros, some terribly clever person explained zeros are zeros because they ultimately amount to zero. Um, and there's some truth in that, that uh, a, a creative job is a creative job. And I think you probably spend as much time on a job that costs 10,000 bucks as you do on a job that costs 10 million. Um, because it's just, you commit to the job, and once you've committed to it, the zeros are irrelevant. Uh, and I still find that now. So I'm not intimidated by zeros, funny enough. Um, I probably would be with, when it comes to, you know, lots of people looking at you, the more people that, uh, that you're having an interview in front of becomes intimidating. But money and, um, and films, it's not intimidating. Uh, do we have more questions? Hi, Mr. Ritchie, a big fan of your films. I'm really excited to see this new one in theaters. Um, you spoke at the top of the interview about constructive collaboration with actors. Are there any writers or directors or even composers you'd wish to conspire with in the future? Uh, I'm sure there are, but that list is probably too long for me to, to uh, begin with. Um, and also it changes. You know, I'll watch a movie tonight and I either will or won't be motivated by what takes place within that. So... It's an endless cornucopia of creative talent which you're inspired by one day and means nothing to you the next. So uh, my list today would be a different list tomorrow. It, what, is, what is on your uh, list today, if you don't mind me asking? What are you watching these days? Oh, God, I hope someone wasn't going to ask me that. <laughs> I, I, te I tell you what, what will be easier is if I ask you or you what you think is good and then I can comment on it. Because <laughs> otherwise it's like, it's too much of a nebulous. It's like, where do you want me to begin? What was the last good movie you saw? Uh, Mistress you... America last night. Mistress America? Yeah. Um, I don't know what that is, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I watched this, a, this is great. I watched this a month ago though. Basically so that's what I was fishing for. One. <laughs> no, I know. I went for the most recent one that I saw, though. <laughs> um, okay, well, what, what have you seen that we, that we all might have seen? <laughs> oh, this is, really, this is really difficult now. Um, this see, is hard. It's to see, now that's the question you asked me. Yeah. So it's not, there's nothing easy about this question. Oh, you know what? A lot of people asked me that this weekend, and I said, because it's out, I said train wreck. I said, oh, I saw train, you know, that's the thing that I imagine everybody could have seen so far, and they haven't, I How many people it. have seen Trainwreck? That's a lot of people. It's pretty good. I got my finger on the pulse guy. I'm on <laughs> I clearly don't. <laughs> uh, let's take another question from the audience. Hi, Mr. Ritchie. I was curious uh, when you're talking about Hans, because uh, I guess, like you said, he's, he knows music, but he doesn't know music, or the other way around. I was curious as to some of the words that he probably used when you were talking with him to describe what he wanted to do, because... He has a way of putting music into words. As far as describing what the music is, um, I'm just curious what like, some of the conversations or the words he used to describe it are. I think I understood that question. Um, but Hans uh, is a pragmatist. And I've, again, I've got a sort of drum roll list that Hans is one of the few people that was born to do the job that he does. He has an unbelievable childish enthusiasm for his uh, craft, which is inspiring, by the way. He's so not cocky. He has so not, has no ego about what it is that he does. And yet he has this, it's an empire. It, it, when you go to the place that he works, it's, his office is based on a, 
uh, Venetian bordello in the 19th century. And uh, it's kind of brilliant. And out the back is the thousands of musicians that he rents rooms out to. So a whole, it's like acres of musicians. Um, and, but he's a pragmatist. So when you're talking to him, there's, there's lots of, look, this is the sound that I want. And really, the conversation sounds like the conversation I'm having with you. Um, and a sound, I want it to sound like that. And you end up banging on the side of a, of a chair or hitting a, a lamp. And there, I've got to tell you, between the pair of us, that's about as eloquent as the conversation ever was. And I, I can see, you know, there, there was a correlation between where, how his mind works and how my mind works. But honestly, if you listen to us, it's, it doesn't sound like an inspiring conversation, a creative conversation. It's very simple. He also, Zimmer has, uh, from when I interviewed him, he has impeccable taste when it comes to music. He has incredibly good taste when it comes to the personal music that he listens to. I think he was telling me that he was going to this EDM festival, like he came out of punk rock. It was all, and that was, I thought I found that pretty inspiring. It's so different than what he actually does. Yeah, well, that's the other thing about hands, you know, and anyone that I, th I find to be inspiring and creative is they're broad. Um, and they haven't been, they haven't uh, tethered themselves to a comfortable corner of what is familiar to them. He, he, and hands is incredibly broad. So he's jogging around all over the gaff, going to uh, uh, experiencing as many different musical samples as he can get his ears around. I mean, that's who he is, and yeah, I love that. Absolutely. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm just curious how Sting came on board for Lockstock in the early. He paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in part. What happened was is um, we asked, we, we're trying to make Lockstock. We, we tried to make it, my partner at the time was Matt Vaughan, um, who's come on to be a very successful film director, actually. And we were a couple of hustlers, and we started trying to make uh, Lockstock, I think, when I was 26. So it took us four years to actually get off the ground. And Sting's wife, Trudy Styler, who's an actress, um, she was the first person that gave us £100,000. And once someone gave us £100,000, then everyone else chipped in. I think there was 10 people that gave us £100,000, something like that. And, uh, and they were the first people. And I, I, there was a great film in the 70s called Quadrophenia. Um, and Sting was in it. And Sting was the balls in it. And um, so I said, by the way, is there any chance we could use Sting? And, uh, you know, his wife had a word. And next thing you know, he, he rolled on in. <laughs> Guys, uh, that's all the time we have. Go see The Man from Uncle. It opens in theaters this Friday. Uh, go check it out on IMAX if you like IMAX. Guy, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching.